Well, good morning, CCDA. Um, I'm here representing Regal Books, and it's a privilege to be with you. Regal Books has a long and rich history with Dr. Perkins. We published his first book, Let Justice Roll Down. We also published with Justice for All. He's on our board of directors, and now we've published a new book with John Perkins and with Shane, and we have a new and rich relationship with Shane. This new book, which you've seen around, is Follow Me to Freedom, Following and Leading as an Ordinary Radical. Now, CCDA is throughout this book. John talks a little bit about the history. He also talks, uh, takes you in to a board meeting at a really a defining moment that involves actually President Obama. CCDA is throughout the book in that we first sat down and had a discussion about this in St. Louis two years ago, did many of the interviews in Miami, and now we release the book this month to you and to everybody else, but starting here at CCDA. It's full of truth, it's full of stories, it's full of sanctified mischief, it's full of nuggets. One of the nuggets that they share with you is to always keep the follower or the leader's best interests in mind, to always keep that in mind. And I've learned that lesson yet again through this and through watching them because you know they live it out, but they lived it out in publishing this book and even putting up with the publisher's demands and deadlines. So we want to thank you and honor you by giving you this plaque to represent the release of this new book. One of the sort of privileges I have, and I've been doing this for the 20 years that we've been doing this, when we discover uh, ministries that we think is really on the cutting edge of society and that God is really working in the lives of these people, I always want to sort of use this hour, this hour is given to me, use this hour sort of as a platform to inspire uh, you to see what God is doing in the country. The whole idea of CCDA was number one was to bring God's people together uh, to, to unite us in purpose and that purpose of living out a holistic gospel and uh, it was not to be denominational it was to be cross-denominational but the whole idea is how can we mobilize the church to get out there and help the people in society who are hurting. And uh, my two presenters this morning is from Victoria, Texas. They will introduce themselves and then they will tell you uh, just a, a capsule about what they are all about. I'm enthused with it. They came up to Jackson and spent some time there uh, in our intimate workshop and we would invite you to come. These are two days and three day workshops. Uh, we don't want more than 12 people in these workshops where they spend time together. And they, they talk about their own programs while they're there. And we take what we know and integrate it into their lives. And of course, one of the things we integrate is the hope to integrate and to solidify is a strong biblical foundation out of which we're doing things. And that this group really represents a group that has taken these principles. And, the, and in most cases, people were using those principles before, but they were using them not understanding that there was a organized philosophy to do that. And that makes it then they can implement it and reproduce themselves and they can feel good about that, that they are following some outstanding principles. So CC Day brings all of you together who are already on the front line. And we try to unite ourselves so that we can have impact not, uh, this organization is to serve your need. This is organized from the, from the grassroots up. Uh, and so, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. 
Okay, uh, my name is Cheryl Miller and I work with Perpetual Help Home in Victoria, Texas. It's a long-term housing program for women that's been in existence about 15 years. Uh, the women we serve are women with serious substance abuse problems, the ex-prostitutes, homeless women. About five years ago, we realized they needed opportunities to get higher skills and higher job paying uh, opportunities, and so we created a micro-enterprise called the Center for Peace. And they actually do training at their center, and at the time, it was conflict resolution and mediation training and language of shalom training. Um, when we came to the conference last year in Miami, uh, I was so excited about seeing all the people that were doing the work. Uh, and two things came out of that conference. One of them was knowing that there was a vast number of resources that we could still tap into. And the second was we found out about the retreat center. And when I heard that we could go spend time in Jackson at the retreat center, we jumped on and seized that opportunity because we realized that we could add the community develop training as one of the types of models that we have in our Center for Peace. And I'm going to let Christina Harrison tell you a little bit about that. Uh, she's the director of the Center for Peace. So for over the last seven years, our organization has been using materials from uh, Dr. Ruby Payne in the Chalmers Center for Economic Development. And now over the last year, we've been using materials from Christian Community Development. So what we did is we took all three of those materials and we picked things from them and we compiled and made a holistic community development training. And we've already tra trained um, several churches in Habitat for Humanity over the last six months. And we also trained a youth in one of those churches that we trained. We trained their youth at a youth camp and they went and applied these principles of development to a poverty area in their community and now they're doing development in their community. What, what makes this training unique is though, I myself and the girls at the center, we are actually climbing out of poverty. So we can bring that voice of, we were once in deep poverty and now we're making steps to come out. We bring our real emotions, experiences. It brings hope to the people that we're working with and the people that we work with in the community that are in poverty. Um, seven years ago, I came to Perpetual Help Home. I'm actually a former resident of Perpetual and I was in bondage to drugs for 12 years. And when I got there, they didn't just address my drug addiction. They dr addressed every aspect of my life. Holistic development is what happened to me. And that's what brought me to the place that I am today. And now I can give people just like me and people that feel bound by poverty hope that they can change. Thank you. Thank you. She, she, came off the, she came off the streets um, uh, and was converted to Christ. And now she's running the center that's taking other women, prostitutes and others, off the streets and is doing the work of God. And so this is the kind of thing, you know, we want to get beyond just the, pro the program provides an opportunity and a vehicle through which we reach out. But in the end, it's not the program. The program gives us the opportunity to get close to the people, but the program is not it. What is it is the change in lives of the people. And then they are now making jobs for these women, these girls that have been on the streets. They are now making a job opportunity for them. This is something that's great. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you so much for this time that we can be together. Lord, and I thank you especially this morning for the hard work of Noel and the hard work of his staff that is working so hard to serve us and so that this we can have the joy and the fellowship and really the the organization that we need to carry out our work here at this center. Lord, we pray for that. We thank you for them. We thank you for how this conference have come along so well. 
Now, Lord, we pray that you would be with us throughout the remaining time and that we would send other peoples back. Thousands would go back to their community and do what these women are doing, reaching out to other churches, and reproducing themselves in the neighborhood and in the community. Now, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes as we look back into the first John, really into the gospel here of John. So bless us and use us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this Bible and this Bible study, CCDA was founded on that. Let me just share a word about how I started studying the Bible, the way I studied the Bible. Uh, first, I come to the scripture with my burden, with my burden, with my concern. That's where God meets us at. God meets us in our pain, especially when he's getting ready to use us. He meets us in our pain, and then he carries us into the pain of the people that he want us to lead. If you follow the Bible, I just went through the Bible on you. I just went through how God works. God want us to become his burden bearers. He saves us so that we could do a carry on that good work that he started 1900 years ago and he showed us how to do it. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so, if we are in Christ now, we are now his workmanship. He brought us in that way. He tells us that. For by grace are you saved through faith. It meant that God by himself rescued us. We didn't have anything to do with it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that was not of yourself. It was an absolutely gift of God. He intervened in our life. It wasn't a cause of our good work. If we could, we would boast. But then he says this. This was the reason for him redeeming us, reaching out to get us. Not just to be Christian. That's not as much of it. He rescued us so that we could be Christian workers, so we could be Christ's workers here on earth. And that's what he intended, that we would be his workmanship here on earth, carrying out his will. Now, we ain't not working. This is not a bunch of do-gooder, liberals, or conservatives working to get to heaven. Jesus talked about heaven as his work alone. And we cannot send no timbers up there. He's going to already have it fixed when we get there. And he said it absolutely profoundly, and he said it so powerful, he did not want Philip and nobody else to ever ask him that question. Long as he would, he said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Don't ask me that question no more, Philip. I've got work for you to do here on earth. I'm going to take care of that. And so he called us now to continue. That's what the church is to be. The church is to be the act of the body of Christ. Christ was God in a body 1,900 years ago. He came, he suffered, and his blood was shed, spilled. We've talked about that. But he rose again, and he's alive, and he ascended back to heaven. And from that position in heaven, he is monitoring us particular what trips us up and messes us up is our sin. And he's in heaven, uh, standing beside the Father, talking to the Father about us. And when we sin, I'm sure the Satan is somewhere around, say, can't you see what your folks are messing up? And all they have to do now is confess that sin to God because he's there. He's our mediator. He's there pleading to the Father. He's there showing the Father his blood-stained hand and his side that I died for them. And all we have to do is get us to confess that. Confess it to God 
and then confess it to our fellow man if we've hurt somebody. Then we're back in that relationship with God. He now sanctifies us. And the word sanctified here means just justifies us, excuse me, justifies us from our sin. And he said we're just as if we had never sinned. And so this morning what we want to do is continue this gospel. There's two verses that's sitting in my mind. I want you to go there. Uh, one is in the gospel of John when he says, uh, for as many as received him, Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, and as many as receive him now, he gives us the power, and he discusses that with Nicodemus in the Bible, in John 3. He discusses it with him. He get, John wanted to know how, Nicodemus wanted to know how could these things be. And he told him that you've got to be born of the Spirit to get into the family of God. He said, can I enter again into my mother's womb and be born again? He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so now he gives us the power to become the sons of God. That we really, if we understood that correctly, that we are now in the family of God. We were born one time in the flesh, and we were one time before we were born by the will of our mothers and fathers. They're the one who begotten us that time. But this time you're born again. And you're born again now by the Father. And then now you're into his family, and you are part of the family of God. And what we are talking about here is a letter that is written to the family of God's people. And this community here looks like that family. This community here, probably your church don't look like this on a Sunday morning. Most of our church is sort of apartheid. Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't believe that the gospel, God's love, have the power to burn through racial and culture barriers and draw us out of the world into a relationship with God and make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. We usually don't believe that. And so we preach the gospel with that doubt. We preach the gospel with that limitation. We don't believe in it. Don't, you don't hear Paul when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, the love of God, the extreme that God went to by giving his only begotten son on the cross to die for each one of you individually and to bring you back into the family and to forgive you for your past sin and forgive you for your sin today and he's going to keep you throughout all eternity. You don't believe that. If we understood that, if we understood that, we would be trying to uh, free the gospel, take it out of our culture captivity, and then be sharing that gospel wherever we find people so they can come hear that wonderful good news and come to know this wonderful, wonderful Savior and be bonded. And the rest of our life then, if we understood it, would be gratitude. We'd be living our life out of gratitude. That was Paul's idea. Paul, when Paul said that he what the, talked about the gospel of power, he said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. And I'm in debt. I'm obligated. I can do no other. He has called me to tell other people about his love. I think we have made it so programmatically. It, it, it's not really about his love. We got to have all these programs going first before we can tell people about their, this love of God. But it's the love of God. And so John here is writing to the family. And this morning what I want to do, and this, this Bible study was never designed uh, to be uh, uh, a person, be turned into a personality cult. The uh, idea of these Bible studies here is to help people get into the Word of God and begin to trust it and begin to see and feel God's love and then be able to share that love with others. That's what it's all about. And so what we're going to do this morning is that we're going to do what I do at 5.30 every week with a group of guys that is my group there, meets in my dining room. Uh, we just read the Bible. We listen to it. See, we need to hear from God. We need to hear from God. 
that's what prayer is all about. Prayer is about listening to God. I said, we have made it all of us talking to God. We, we can talk to God. He tells us to come and talk to him. But it's more, we call Elijah the man of prayer. You know why we call Elijah the man of prayer? Because he listened to God and he heard him. And then when he heard God, he acted up on it. And he heard God in prayer. And so prayer is really being still and listen to God. And that we can hear God, we can hear God uh, through his word. His word is here. That's why John, in this, even in this epistle, that's why he makes the incarnation of Jesus, the word of God incarnated. In the beginning was this word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. By faith we understand that the world was formed by the word of God. They took on that theme. Now he wants you and me, when he was here on earth, he tells us in order to avoid temptation or to go through temptation, he says that you should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we read the Bible then in order to hear God speak to us. And so this morning, we want to listen to God speak. If there was a verse I would call it, the son of peace, of this chapter here. I would call that verse one in chapter three. I would say that's the centerpiece. Let me read that one. And then we're gonna start reading this morning. I'm gonna start reading in chapter four and we're gonna read then throughout the whole chapter, the whole book. And so we're just gonna read the Bible this morning. I might do a little commentary on the Bible as it go along. I can't help but do that. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but what we're going to do here, and, and I want you to get in the mood of, of listening to God as you read it. As you read it, we want to hear God speak to us. This is the verse here that we're opening with. Right, and then, I, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little, little old benediction when I get through with it. That's what Paul would have done. Paul would have read this and he'd had to stop. If you read Paul's letters, you read his epistles, particularly the book of Romans, when he thought about the depths of God's love and God's provision, Paul would always have to give a little benediction because it was so profound. This verse is so profound that we'll have to have a little benediction. Listen to what he says. Thank how much the Father loved us. He loved us so much that he let us be called his children. As we truly are, to be called his children, as we truly are. But since the people of this world don't know who Christ is, they don't know who we are. Then he says, my dear friend, we are already God's children. We already belong to God. You're in the family of God. Now you've been born again. Now you have this eternal life. Now what we are talking about this week is then how do we live that out in the world? And how do we then become that salt and that light as we go about in society? You see, it comes through our discipleship. It comes through shaping our character so that we can be God's people. And in any situation we're in, we then become a witness for Jesus Christ. Our present is a witness. And our speaking is a witness. And so our whole self, that's what Paul meant when he said, I beseech you therefore, brothers and sisters, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, presented holy and accepted before God. And he says, uh, be not conformed then to this world system, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And that's what we are doing now is trying to line our lives up with the will of God. 
it, you, what most of us are always trying to do is trying to pull God over to what we've already decided to do. That is not the way it needs to be. We decide what we're going to do apart from God, and then we try to get God to bless us to go in the direction that we need to go in. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is try to seek what God is doing. What it is God wants to accomplish. And what it is he wants you and I to join with him in accomplishing in the community. Now he has told us a lot of those things that we can get on board with. You can get on board with going to the prison. We can get on board with uh, if somebody's hungry, feed them. If somebody's thirsty, give them drink. If somebody's naked, close them. If they need a place to live, give them some shelter. As much as you are doing that all the time, you are doing it for God. So we don't have to sit around and pray about that one. You know, so there are some, th there's some you don't have to pray about it. You know, sometimes I ask people to do something just very, very simple. And then it comes to, I got to pray. But what do you got to pray about it for? God has already told you. What we need to do now is obey God. That's the idea is obey God, to obey God, to obey God, and do God's will. Then let's go to our reading in chapter 4 this morning. We freaking now have a Bible, Bible class. I done stopped my commentary here. Let's listen to this. I skipped there because Paul, not Paul, John, have said in chapter 3, the rest of it, he said exactly what we're finna say here. If you read it, you'll see it. And so instead of me saying it two times like John did, we don't have time. John had a lot of time. We don't have to, we, <laughs> John could have been on the Isle of Patmos. He could have been alone by himself, and he had plenty of time to write this letter. <laughs> but, but we are restrained here by, this, by the time clock here. So what we're going to do then is that we're going to read this letter here. Listen at it as I read it. That's the idea. Look on the stream. Is it on the stream, y'all? Yeah, okay. Look on the stream. We're ready now to go to chapter, chapter 4. Listen at this. Now, be quiet. And let's listen. And see, can we hear God speaking to us? Dear friend, don't believe everyone who claims to have the Spirit of God. Test them all to find out if they really, this spirit, really comes from God. He says, now many false prophets have gone out into the world. And the way this prosperity theology is being propagated in the world is very close to false stuff because it's too tied to my own selfish desire. And selfish desire is sin. That's what sin is, our own selfish desire. What we need to be doing is praying that his kingdom come, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all of this stuff that we are praying about, all this stuff that we are being promised that we'll get if you send me $5, if you send me $5, I know one thing that would happen. I will have $5. I don't know what else would happen. I can't promise you nothing else. But I can promise you that I have $5. So if y'all want to do that for me, go ahead on and do it. I, I'm not making any promise. I'm not going to send you no head rag. I'm not going to send you no blessed handkerchief. I'm not going to send you some tap water that I got out of uh, Israel. I'm not going to do all that to you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have me $5. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, let's get, keep going here. That's, that's my hobby horse. That's my hobby horse. You can see that. But people are, are following that foolishness like anything you ever seen in the world. God wants to give us a good mind. God wants to, us to be creative. God wants us to work hard. God wants us to give all that we can to his kingdom, but he also wants us to save all that we can. God also wants us to not be a slave to our own consumerism and be in debt and working all that kind of stuff. God, but God would rather, and you would feel so much better if you could earn that. I promise 
Grandma Brilli, that the woman who raised Vera May, my wife, uh, I promised her, because I was from across the track, and I was poor, and our folks were bootleggers and gamblers, and we was a bad family. But I, and, and their family, they were religious people. They were good Baptists. I mean, they were good Baptist people. And when they thought, heard that I was wanting to marry River May, that was a big deal, and they didn't want it to happen. And so I told Vera May, I told Miss Brilly, I said, if you let me have her, I take care of her. I take care of her. You know, I tell her that all the time. I hold her hostage. I got her held hostage. <laughs> I have held her hostage for 58 years. <laughs> held her hostage. Now, I feel good about that. I feel good about that. I, she haven't been on welfare. We haven't been on welfare. I feel good about that because I'm a workaholic. I like to work. You can say that, and I feel good. That I, can, I tell her that every day. Tell her about every day, honey. I'm the one taking care of this. I'm the one, I'm the one that's taking care of this. This is my duty. That's what God wants. And you're going to feel good about yourself. In fact, if people give you too much, you're going to eventually want to not even see them. You're not going to like them as much. Yeah. Okay, let's go here and finish. I told her I wasn't going to do all this commentary. I was going to, I was going to, let me, let's go on here. We won't get through if I keep doing that uh, here. Uh, but when, okay, here. The big deal here, and we're going to see this, the big deal here is that we got to keep our faith alive. Now, this is what keeps your faith alive. What keeps your faith alive is that you believe that Jesus, that lived 1,900 years ago, was the incarnated God, and that he's alive today, and that he's in your life. And you've got to believe that. You've got to believe that. If you start believing other things, you're believing in the wrong thing. It is believing in that that God says. It's believing in that that God comes unto us and, in, it, and empowers us to do his work. You will receive the Holy Spirit when he come upon you. And then you shall be witnesses. Unto me. Okay, let's go here. Let's continue here. Okay, he says now. But someone, uh, okay, uh, let's go back to verse 2. And you can know the one who comes from God. His spirit says that Jesus Christ had a truly human body. That's important. That Jesus Christ had a truly human human body. But when someone doesn't say this about Jesus, you know that person has a spirit that doesn't come from God and is the enemy of Christ. You know that this enemy, we knew that this enemy was coming into the world and now he's already here. Now, what is the Antichrist? You would say that. What is the Antichrist? That's what he's saying here. You know what the Antichrist is? The Antichrist is all of those ideals and thoughts that's against God and that are turning you against God, that causing you to deny that Jesus Christ was the eternal Son of God. And your faith has got to be in Jesus Christ. That's what faith got to be because he's the revelation of God, he's the way back to God, and he is God for us here on earth. And so let's continue here, what he says here. He says here, here. But, but, but when someone doesn't say this about Jesus, you know that person has a spirit that don't come from God and is the enemy of Christ. You know that the enemy was coming into the world and he's not already here. I would have said that. He says again, children. And this way he's saying children now, he's saying it to everybody. In chapter 2, he pointed out those children. You remember that? The parents, the other ones. But now he's engulfing all of us. All of us now is in the family of God. And now he's telling us how to behave within his family as we are his children down here on, uh, down here on earth. Uh, children, you belong to God. Verse 4, you belong to God. And you have defeated these enemies. Which means I know a lot of people give all their attention to Satan like they almost worship him. Christians 
almost. They are fought in Satan for everything. I mean, they, uh, they tied in to Flip Wilson. The devil made me do this. Okay, the devil made you. We're going we're gonna to see it here. The devil don't make you do that much. You, what, when you are drawn away of your own lust and enticement, that's what draws you away. We're going to see here that we don't have to live with defeated life with the devil controlling us. That's what he's finna get at. If you're a child, this is what this teaching is about this morning. That God's power can be released in your life if you understand and stay in touch with the fact that Jesus is alive and that he's in your life. Look what he says here now. You belong to God and you have defeated the enemy. God's spirit is in you. And, in, and it is more power in you than the one that is in the world. You get the idea? There is more power available to us than Satan's power. So keep, stop contributing all of this to Satan and live this defeated life. Look what he says here. Uh, he says, these enemies belong to this world and the world listen to them because they speak its language. They speak it now. That's what gets me a little bit now. A little bit of like the world will do something and we Christians will think that we have to do something just like that in order to get the people to come to church. And, and then what we do, then whatever it was we made to do like that, we baptize it and call it Christian. I meet people all the time. Now, I'm not against, uh, uh, absolutely against rap. But people will come along and they'll say, they'll say, they'll say let's have some Christian rap. I said, what made it Christian? What made it Christian? What makes something Christian is they believe that this came from God. This came from God. And so what we're usually doing as Christian is going along, taking the devil stuff, and then putting Christian up on it, tacking Christian onto it. Now, I want you to know, I don't know there are any big revivals in the world that's coming out of rap. And I don't know whether or not Christian, because it's so deadly, because it's so deadly, uh, I don't know whether or not the lurch and all of that, so much death, is good for us. But I, I'm, I'm asking people to show me, show me. It's good entertainment. If you would just say this is entertainment rap, I'd go along with it. This is entertainment rap. You know, I like the blues. I don't make the blues Christian religion. I don't say the, the blues. I'm listening to some Christian blues. <laughs> I like jazz, you know. And you're going to say, I'm looking at some Christian jazz. You don't say that. Y'all see, we are practicing Christianity to light. We're not putting our faith in the resurrected Savior who can help us and lead us and guide us. And look at here. All Christian faith begins with truth first. The Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him and serve him must serve him in spirit and in truth. And so we got to test things to see whether or not this, in fact, represents God. I think that Christians ought to be able to come up with music that is better than the world can create in the world. I believe that. So I don't think we need to be walking around as copycats. I think we need to be producing the authentic thing in what we're doing. Let me keep going here. I know some of you people who love rap so much, and it's okay. Don't just call it Christian. That's what I'm getting at. Don't call it Christian. Rap. Uh, 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 it says here, this word language here, language is the important thing. I'm really believing that the Christian church has got to reestablish a language of love. I have looked a little bit at revivals, you know, that I look at them. Almost in any great movement, almost a language of itself emerges. Do you know that? In order for something to perpetuate, get going, you have to 
develop a language to go with it. Then you have to develop music behind it to push it along. Push it along. We need a better language. We need a, a more of a language of affirmation. More of a language. We need to, our conversation need to be more about God and His pushing us along to do His work in the world. We need a better language. We need a better language. We need to get rid of this racist language. We need to get rid of this cold talk. This more majority and Christian majority and all this kind. All that is cold talk for racism. Cold talk for racism in our society. We need a language of love. We need, a, we need to sing the children's song. God loves the little children, all the children of the world, brown and yellow, black and white. They all are precious in his sight. God loves the little children of the world. We need language that affirms us, affirms us. And I'm liking what this music team here is doing. The other morning when they played St. Uh, Francis of Assisi's prayer, I almost could almost just, I had to hold myself together because it was so beautiful. These words were so reinforcing. Uh, they were reading the kind of words of the kind of person I would like to be in the world. We need a new and a better uh, language. We really need to be singing some new songs, singing some new songs in the world. Look what he says here, uh, here, here, okay, uh, that world, listen to them. Uh, we belong to God, and everyone who knows God listen to us. But the people who don't know God won't listen to us. That is how we can tell the spirit that speaks the truth from the one that tells lies. Oh, we got to be careful when we are speaking. We got to be speaking the truth from God. My dear friend, we must love each other. Love comes from God. And when we love others, it shows that we have been given this new eternal life. We are now God's children, and we know him. We know him. God, for God is love. And everyone who doesn't love others have never known him. God showed his love for us when he sent his only son into the world to give us life. Real love isn't our love for God, but his love for us. The Christian conversion is a response to God's love for us, that we see how much God loves us, and then we, because of that love, we fall in love with God. That's the way you get married. This is the way you get married, is that you discover that you love somebody. You see somebody and you discover that you love that. You begin to love that person. What, what seeks the deal seals the deal and you talk to that person and you discover that that person loves you. And so what I discover is that God loves us. God loves us. God loves us. You see, somebody say, I found God. Oh, God, we're lost. God found you. God found you. God found you because you discovered his love for you. Let's get, keep going here. I have a love for God and his love for us. God sent his son to be the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. I guess you've got to know that. That's the big issue. That's the big issue in living the Christian life is when we sin. We've already told you how to deal with that. When we sin, we're going to sin. When we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteous. Dear friend, since God loves us this much, we must love each other. We must love each other. I think Wayne Garner and I was talking this morning, and I think it was, we were talking about it, and that when... when Sometimes what you need to do is when you're talking to people, is just sit and listen to them. You, you see, we're supposed to be 
image bearers. See, see we brought the image of Adam. Now we are supposed to be bearing in this new creation, we're supposed to be bearing the image of Christ. And that people then, in a quiet way, if you listen carefully, people will then has this possibility of seeing Christ in you. And, and so sometimes it don't take words. Sometimes it just stay being with that person and just really listening to that person and letting that person talk his way out and they can see Christ in you. Okay, verse 12. No one have seen God. But if we love each other, that's what he's saying. God lives in us, and his love is truly in our heart. He's saying if we be quiet, God's love will break through, break through in our heart. Somebody said that, I, uh, that Mother Teresa would send her workers out into the street to pick up people who would die and would just bring them into the shelter and just sit with them and hold their hand. What well, I believe that some of those people we're going to see in heaven because they saw love in her. They saw a uh, divine love. And because of that, they put their trust in Jesus Christ. See, we have to bear the image of God by our acts in the world. It's more than words. It's our deed. And he said, we're to preach the gospel in love and in deeds and in truth in our life. Let's continue here. Here. It's God here. Uh, God has given us his spirit. Now, he says here, no one has seen God, but if we love others, God lives in us. And his love is truly in our heart. God has given us his spirit. That is how we know that we are one with him, just as he is one with us. God sent his son to be the savior of the world. We saw his son and are now telling others about him. God stays one with everyone who openly says that Jesus is the son of God. That's how we stay one with God. And we are sure that God is sure that God loves us. You know what he's saying here? When we testify to God, when we testify to others, it is a it is a way of God seeing you in that testimony. And he reinforces his love in you because you are obeying him. In the world. Let's keep going here. This is some good stuff here. Here. Okay. What verse do we stop at? Help me here now. Uh, okay. Look, look. We at verse, uh, I, I, go, I go to verse uh, 16. Did, yeah, yeah. Verse 16. And are sure that God loves us. God is love. God is love. The nearest, the nearest evidence of God revealing himself is in divine love and in you and I trying to show divine love. That's the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan story is a person who he was, didn't know whether or not he knew God or not. He, at least from the Jewish point of view, he didn't know God. But what happened is he showed the love of God. And then he says to us, go and do likewise. And that fulfills the whole law of God. That was the question. That was the question. How do I live in obedience to the law? And the story of the Good Samaritan tells us how you can live that out. In reality, Paul even says that people can live this out without the written law. He says it's a law written in our own heart. It's a law written in our own behavior. And so when we are acting out of love, 
we are doing the will of God in the most powerful way that we can. It's nothing more important than an unconditional act of the Christian. That becomes divine love. That becomes life-giving love. Okay, God love. If we keep loving others, we stay one in our heart with God, and he will stay warm with us. If we truly love others and live as Christ did in this world, you get that? And live as Christ did in this world, we won't be worried about the day of judgment. A real love for others will chase those worries away. A real love for others will chase those worries away. The thought of being punished is what makes us afraid. It shows that we have not really learned to love. It's, it's, it says love is an art and a craft. Love is an art and a craft. It, it, it's something that we learn how to do. And he's telling us to do love. Do love. And that shows, that shows then that we really love God. We love God. We, we love because God loved us first. But if we say we love God and don't love others, we are lying. We cannot see God. So how can we love God if we don't love the people we do see? What he's actually saying that people, I even think in their broken, frail condition, and this is why we ought to go at people who are broken, we still, they still bear a little bit of the image of God. They still bear a little bit of God's image. And that's why we should be going for them. Going for them in the, in the world. Look what he says here. Here, he said, the commandment, the commandment that God has given us is love God and love others. Love God. That's authentic Christianity. That's authentic Christianity in a nutshell. Love God, love others. Then he says, as we go on here, He's going to go into victory. And I'm going to go through this uh, fast. We've got seven minutes to, uh, to do it. If we believe that Jesus is truly Christ, we are God's children. I mean, this, I mean your faith has got to be in the right thing. Or better yet, your faith has got to be in the right person. And that faith, that's the key. If y'all following me and tracking with me, your faith must be in this person who can accomplish these things through us. And the idea here, if our faith is in him, he will give us the power and the strength to work out his life in us. That's what Paul is trying to say in Galatians 20, 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, he says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is not doing much work. God is doing the work through him. God is working out his will through us on earth. Look, let's go on here now. He said, we are truly his, his uh, children. We show our love for God by obeying his commandment. By obeying his commandment. Let's try to do this. Let's try to do this. If we try to do this, your life will be better. Uh, I was telling some guys, I was, we, were, we were studying the book of Psalm, Psalm 1, which is my favorite psalm. And the psalm says that we, we ought to walk in this 
shout out to the ungodly and do all that stuff. He said, but our delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law shall we meditate day and night. We'll be like trees planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruits in its season. God is doing that. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever we do, we will have success. And I said, somebody, I, somebody said, one of the guys said, I don't have time to study God's word. I about flipped. I said, fool, do you want to be successful? <laughs> God has just given you a recipe for success. And if you believe that and all of your steps out of that, you'll be successful. Success ain't no accident. Christian success is in obeying God. Let me finish this here. Let's keep going here. He talks here about how God, well, this is Jesus, water and blood came out of from the side of Jesus. It wasn't just water, but it was blood. The Spirit tells us, but he tells us now how he, he thinks of that fountain that filled with blood. And because of the Spirit, uh, because the Spirit is truthful, in fact, there are three who tell about it. They are the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and they all agree. We believe what people tell us, but we can trust God. We can trust what God says even more. And God is the one who has spoken about his son. Now he's reinforcing this. Our faith has got to be directly in Jesus Christ, who is the revelation of God. And once you get Jesus Christ, you've got the Father, you've got the Son, you've got the Spirit, all of that go together in one package, in one package, you see. And it's Jesus that pulls that package together. He's the one who pulled that package together. So we stay one in our heart with him. If we say we have faith in God's son, we believe what God has said. But if we don't believe what God has said about his son, it is the same as calling God a liar. God has also said that he has given us eternal life. Now that's what our theme here. Our theme here is how can we live out this eternal life? And we are living this out here on the on earth by us obeying his commandments to love each other. We are living it out. This is about as close as we can get to living it out. This gives us the assurance and the power we need to move out into the world. Let's continue here. Uh, here. Oh, verse knowing about this eternal life. Uh, verse, verse 13. All of you have faith in the Son of God and I am writing to let you know that you have eternal life. We are certain that God will hear our prayers when we ask for what pleases him. Did y'all hear that? I don't know if you hear that or not. Hear that. God, give me a new car. He didn't give it to me today, but he's going to give it to me tomorrow. He might not give it to you tomorrow. God, give me this. You might not get it. Is it designed to please him? If it's that designed to please him. If you are getting that car to go to work so you can take care of your children, he's listening to you. He'll listen to you. He's listening to you. If you doing that and all this might enable you to do God's will, God is listening to you because this pleases God. But asking it up on my own lust, you have not because you ask not. You ask the mist because you wanted to consume this upon your lust. But if it's to please God and to carry out God's will, you in good company. You in good company. God can, he will hear our prayer. And he will listen. If we know that he listened, when we pray, we are sure that our prayers have already been answered. This is pretty powerful stuff. This is pretty powerful stuff. This is, this is, this is not just folklore here. This is coming from the Word of God. Look what he says. Supposing you see one of your... Uh, oh, and now he talks about sin. Supposing you see one of... Uh, commit sin that isn't a deadly sin. We call that the sin unto death. Uh, if someone see him, see, you can pray to God 
and that person will be given eternal life if the sin is not unto death. You can pray for that person, and God will give that person, uh, give you eternal life. But the sin must not be one that is deadly. Everything that is wrong is sin, but not all sin are deadly. We are sure that God's children uh, do not keep on sinning. What he's saying is God's children don't practice sin. You don't practice sin. Yeah. Uh, God's own son protects them, and the devil cannot harm them. This is good stuff, folks. Don't make the devil divine. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are certain, my time is gone, we are certain that we come from God and that the rest of the world lies in the power of the evil one. We know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come and has shown us the true God. And because of Jesus, we now belong to the true God who gives us eternal life. Last word. It drops out of the sky. I don't, sometimes I look at this. Why did John drop this in here? Children, keep yourself from owl. Owl is a substitute for God. You've got a substitute. And I believe that a lot of addiction in the world, drugs, dope, alcohol, sex, all, a lot of these addictions come from the fact that we have placed something there or that in place of God. And that becomes our hour. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for this day. Now be with, particularly with Noel, as he shares with us this morning. Lord, I pray that your spirit be upon him as he speak to us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to hang on. Just for a um, before you all leave, I, I, could I ask you all to stand with me and just pray together um, and just give God thanks for Dr. Perkins? Um, I don't know if you understand what a treat it is to be able to be in the presence of this great man and his amazing family. It is an honor. And to have Vera May here with us today, this is, I mean, this, this sister, I mean, this is great. And so, um, would you all just pray with me together and, um, and just give thanks for Dr. Perkins and his, and his amazing, beautiful young wife over here and, uh, and, and the whole Perkins family and just what an honor it is to be in the presence of this man. This is a truly an honor and, um, and I, I, I'm just grateful. Heavenly Father, just, I just thank you so much for the life of this man um, and for the, the whole entire Perkins family, Lord. We just are so grateful to be, to be able to, um, to be in the presence of the man that you have used to impact all of us so much. We are just so grateful for health. We are grateful for um, wisdom. And Lord, Lord, I'm just grateful for discernment and, and humility. And Lord Jesus, I just, um, I just ask for many, many, many more years of, uh, of being able to be blessed by this man. And Jesus, I just pray that you would have your protection over him and everything that he does, his foundation and Jackson and, and, the, and the ministry that he is, uh, he is continuing to do. And Lord Jesus, we are just so grateful. Um, and Lord, we just ask that you just continue just to have your hand over him and his bride and, and their ministry to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. Take a few minutes, go ahead outside. There's uh, people that you have. A few minutes. Yeah, I'm going to.